in that area is that you have a lot of room between 
I 
figured it. 
heard was Homer Simpson screaming from my phone. Needless to say, I uninstalled that game. I have not played it since. It took a good two hours for my wife and I to fall back asleep, but it freaking terrified. Oh. Story number
Someone 
or something had slashed two of our car's tires, so we were not just imagining it. Story number 25 or so after this, I'm gonna stop counting the creepiest. in the middle of the back country of Maine one night. For those who have never been, you drive hours without seeing civilization, let alone another car, just trees and trees and trees. My friend was in a daze when he saw something up ahead. In the street he stopped. He could not quite make out what it was. It was moving, but moving so slowly and lethargically. As curious as he was, he tried to get really close to it. He gets out of his truck. Is that a baby? Holy shit. Sure enough, it was a baby. He gets out of the truck, stunned. Surely this baby is not abandoned. It couldn't be. He walks over there and goes to pick it up. It's a freaking baby doll slowly by a string with somebody on the other end. He gets out of there as fast as his legs would carry him. Does not stick around for who is on the other end. Patient malefactors. Back roads in Maine are scary at night. I was driving down one around 2 a.m. A couple of years ago, slowed down to take one of the 500 curves in the road when all of a sudden there was a car stopped right in the middle of the road, no lights on, driver's door open, stopped in my high beams to see if anyone was okay or in the car, but noticed two guys coming out of the woods beside my back doors on both sides, crouching down, going towards my door. I slammed the gas and almost sideswiped the car they left in the middle of the road. There was no cell service and they had to have known that. It was so dark that if they came out of the woods a couple feet by my car, I would probably have never noticed them and it would have ended very badly. He only So, honey. 
past few years since that night, I have met one other person that has seen the same thing. The same creature on the same road. What does this mean? Well, I'm a non-believer, but goddamn, I believe now. That's the best I got. Driving home, clear, quiet night. Road is empty due to it being so late. I am dying to get home and to relax, take my shoes off, sit on my favorite couch. I pass one of the churches about a half mile from my house. I see a huge cylindrical object hanging in the air directly over the steeple of the church. I do a huge double take, slow my car down to a complete stop, staring in disbelief at this massive. I have no other word for it but airship just idly hanging over this church. Immediately the words are what the is that? Now look, I'm no expert when it comes to airplanes or blimps, but I have seriously never seen anything like this. Kind of a long tube with weird vent-like protrusions that acted as a beacon of light. This threw odd shadows on the rest of the quote-unquote airship, uh, for bat lack of a better term, to where I could not make out the rest of it, aside from a strange blinking red light at the very top of it. It's kind of like a radio tower, I guess, but they don't usually hover above churches, I don't think, or I've never known them to. But it was completely and absolutely silent. No motors, propellers, nobody around. I must have watched it for a full minute and a half before the thing started to lift off like a balloon would. To one side of the church, then without warning, it takes off with speed of light. Zero to a thousand in an instant. I watched in disbelief as it zoomed into the night sky. I banged a U-turn and tried to follow it for any kind of time, but I couldn't. It just disappeared into the sky. I have no idea what I saw. I don't understand what I saw. I've seen alien shows and I laugh at them, but maybe there's some truth. I don't know. Has anybody else seen anything like this? I don't like talking about it in mixed company because of how weird and unbelievable the story is. I've tried rationalizing and come up with some kind of solution, but none of them make sense. It is what it is, I guess. We don't really know what's out there, do we? Driving to a barbecue on July 4th 
shared with another pilot we were going from Ohio to Florida. He says, there's almost no gas. I have to land immediately. We were above the clouds. My dad was a professional pilot. Something must have gone wrong. My mom flipping out. My older brother and me thought it was really cool, but it wasn't. Managed to find a small airport. We had to get another plane. The only one they had was pull a vomit on the floor. Flying the rest of the way was a blast smelling that. We were traveling over a big mountain in my dad's RV. My mother and stepkids were taking the small car we dragged along. I stayed in the RV with my dad and baby girl starting to go down the mountain. One of the three brakes failed. Then the second brake failed. He was flipping out. All I have is the foot brake and it's going to, it isn't going to make it. I ask, what will you do if it fails? I have to crash into the side of the mountain. He had to let off the foot brake as much as possible, going fast and winding around the mountain. We made it to the bottom. He wanted to drink, but we were on an Indian reservation. They didn't sell alcohol. Luckily, he had a little wine left. My mom was not going over the mountain again to get us some wine. Nervous breakdown and no wine. Top. I was in a car crash with my mother. My skull was fractured. I jumped off a runway, runaway horse and broke my arm, tore up my neck muscle. Beaten and kicked with army boots with someone trying to break my neck when that failed nearly being stabbed. These are all things that happened just to me. When I was a teen, the doctors told me that I would die young or of either a broken neck or bacterial meningitis. They told me to sit in a chair the rest of my life doing nothing. I couldn't do that. I was too hyper. After all the crashes, bucked off many times by my horses and all of the 19 bouts of bacterial meningitis survival, all of the major surgeries, the last ones, my surgeon said, you may not wake up from this one. I lived through every damn one of them. I'm grateful to be alive. I do not take life for granted. And there is a picture of this person. Wow. My boyfriend and I were parked. seen us there. 
medical student commits suicide by jumping in front of a train. I couldn't understand what would make somebody so young do such a thing. The impact of the train did a lot of damage. But here's the scary and disturbing part. Didn't kill him right away. The train went over him, and there was enough space between the ground and the train for him to avoid being crushed. From my angle on the train platform, I could see his chest going up and down under the train and knew he was still alive. I hoped to God he was not conscious. One of his legs was extended after he jumped and he got his foot cut off. That's the image that burned itself into my memory. Bloody exposed end of a foot still in the sneaker. Police showed up within minutes, cleared us onlookers away from the scene paper article the next day said he was rushed to the hospital died shortly after this is the most horrifying thing that I cannot explain I fell down the stairs Yes, all of them, with a loaded bowl full of cereal milk. Rolling down the stair to the stairs, I noticed the bowl of cereal was still full. I don't know how it did not spill. No milk or cereal. I thought I had magical powers for the longest time. Then I was open to... Then as I went to the open... The garage door, my girlfriend slams the door open and smacks the bowl of cereal out of my hands. The milk and lucky charms goes flying over my chest, pants, and freshly shined shoes. I was horrified and deeply disappointed all in the same moment. Honestly, I never got to tell her about the story because she was so pissed at me about something else I completely forgot about. and the people 
looking young man came into the store, started talking to my sister, 17 at the time. He introduced himself as Ted Smith. We laughed and said we must be related, as mom's maiden name was Smith. Chatted us both up, but focused on my sister. He purchased an armoire, but said he'd have to get his truck, since at the moment he was driving his VW Bug, an old one. He then asked my sister and me if we wanted to go out for dinner that night with him. We were sweaty and dirty from work. I had a baby to care for, and his sister already had a boyfriend. We said, no, thank you. But thanks, Ted. He asked me to ride with him to get his truck so he could drop his bug off at the auto shop for repairs, but by that point I had to get home to my baby. I was still nursing her and thought my breasts were about to explode. However, he wouldn't give up trying to get one or both of us away from the shop. He said he could come back around 10 that evening for his armoire and asked whether one of us or both of us would be there. No, he said. The shop was closed at six. So persistent. How about tomorrow? No, we close at six. Saturdays close at four. He has weather. One of us could meet him early in the morning, five thirty. No. He was getting really creepy. My sister and I were rolling each other, eyes at each other. Eventually, he got the pictures that he was sorry, but he couldn't buy the armor. We couldn't be flexible. We hated to give up the sale, but after he had been there for two hours, we thought he was just looking and taking up our time. We still had a lot of work to do on the furniture that had just arrived in the shop. Lucky for us, because probably one of us would have gone. Finally, we just wanted to finish our work and go home. At 6 p.m., we were leaving. His VW bug was parked outside, and he has weather. We wanted to go for coffee, especially my sister. Again, thanks, Ted, but no thanks. Like we said earlier, we have plans. He was so persistent. Finally, I said, sis, let's go. I'll take you home, even though she had her own car there. For some reason, I didn't want to leave her to drive home alone with this guy around. He drove off in his bug, and we really didn't think of it again until the next year when the picture appeared in the paper. Dead Bundy still freaks me out and makes my heart race to think that my sister or I could have been his victims. The most horrifying thing my parents have ever done. I was eight. My mother told me she was either going to kill herself or kill my dad. Told me I had to choose one. When I was nine, my mom made me sleep out in the porch in January after beating me with the belt because she said I was demon-possessed. At ten, my mom put me and my three brothers in the car with her, drove by, to my dad's workplace, and rammed into his parked car with her own car while we were in the car with her. Sixteen, my mom slammed my head against the wall multiple times, beat me in the back of the legs with a stick until blood ran down my legs, soaked through my pants and pulled onto the floor. She then locked me in my room for almost two weeks with nothing but bread and water to eat. Eighteen, she made me work to support the family instead of letting me finish school, tried to keep me financially tied to her. Nineteen, I left and never looked back. That was enough of that. most disgusting thing you've ever witnessed. Warning, really gross. I was ten. My dad brought me with him when he visited my aunt and uncle in southern Indiana. He and my mom were divorced at the time, so my mom was not there. Or it would have gone down differently. My uncle, by marriage, had caught a large snapping turtle and was going to kill it so it could be cleaned and eaten. and shoved it in its mouth and pumped it full of water until it died. 
younger girl than I am now, I should say, but I'd just gotten my driver's license about six months prior. As I'm driving along, a young girl just ran out in front of the car. I unfortunately hit her. First, everything seemed to go in slow motion. I can recall sitting in the car, looking at her lifeless body in a crumpled heap on the floor and thinking I had sat there for hours. Witnesses confirmed to police I was out of the car checking the girl in a split second. I don't remember this. The accident occurred in the town center of my hometown at rush hour in full view of queuing traffic to my left and shops to my right. I stood in the middle of the road. When I began to feel the shock take hold, I distinctly remember a shop owner saying to onlooker, she's going into shock, we need to get her inside. This lovely shop owner made me a real sugary cup of tea and sat me down as I felt it was I were having a seizure. I was becoming hypothermic. My limbs were all shaking uncontrollably. I was struggling to speak due to shivering. So much so that I didn't manage to get any of the first cup of tea into my mouth and said, felt it all over the top. shop owner's collection of designer watches she had on the counter. I was fully aware of what was happening to me and kept apologizing for spilling tea everywhere. Time felt like it stood still, and looking back, the whole series of events feels more like a dream than something that actually happened. I was taken by the police a few minutes later to the breathalyzer and interviewed and remained in a similar state for 30 minutes. The police confirmed at the scene I was not at fault in a bid to try and call me. At the time, her outcome was unknown. The police forced me to get back into the car and drive the final mile home with the police escort front and rear. Fearing I would never drive again unless I got back behind the wheel immediately. I have to say, driving with the head all in your windshield and the victim's hair all stuck there made for a pretty horrific journey. It turns out the lady who ran out in front of me was rushing to get to the shops before they closed. Fortunately, despite a head-on collision at 25 miles per hour being thrown into a nearby lamppost, she made a full recovery. I took a card for the shop owner the following day to thank her for taking care of me and offered to pay for the watches I damaged. She declined. I remained in a state of shock for about five days afterwards and couldn't crying, knowing I couldn't have done any more to prevent the accident, but could still have killed her. It was too much to bear. The way I saw it, the fact she was still alive was sheer luck more than anything else. Now this 
this leads people to believe that he possibly was capable of writing these advanced ciphers himself, but why would he kill himself? No one is able to be able to make heads or tails of this note found on him. How or why die? Has this not been tied together? He passed, or how his body had undergone almost a month's worth of composition, decomposition in three, three days. That is a mystery that I guess we will never, ever find out. Which is too bad. So, so, okay.
was running to the freezer, my teacher grabbed my arm and told me, I thought you were inside the freezer. In that moment, we stayed there staring at the door until he stopped the alarm and opened the door behind him with a heaving broom waiting for the worst. But when he opened the freezer, we didn't find anything that could have activated the motion sensor. There wasn't anybody, at least not alive, decided. It was enough for the day, and we left the morgue early. Oh I don't know if I could work in a morgue at all. Like I've said before. So the ghost of a former patient haunted, haunted, and had us lessened a rehab center. I used to work overnights in an adolescent re rehab center, for short, short time. About a week into the job, I was told about Amanda. Amanda was a resident from ten years prior who managed to hang herself in the shower. According to my co-worker, she would sometimes make appearances at night in the form of making a whimpering sound. of 
so remote.
somebody saw a man. A man wearing a scream mask at the back door. Now, if you've ever watched that movie, you can attest to how terrifying that would be. Worked overnight as a master control operator when I was younger. Around 3 a.m., I catch sight of the camera we have aimed at the back door. I see something or someone standing there wearing a scream mask, staring straight into the camera, not moving. A little bit perturbed and a little bit disturbed, I go to the back room, which is magnetically sealed and dead bolted for overnight security. The door is almost impossible to force open from the inside, let alone from the outside. So I look out at the people, and there is no one there. I head back to control and see them walk back into the frame. Creepily, they wave at the camera and walk away. I called the police. They found nothing, and the camera does not. Absolutely terrifying. I give that probably at least a 10. I'm a student in Alaska, trapped in a snowstorm. I worked as a lab student and alert. No, 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 but it's most northernly. second term in January, so complete darkness. The lab I worked at was an atmospheric lab, so it was far from the main base. I would say five kilometers, three miles or so. Around the lab, there are lifelines leading to all of our instruments outside. However, on this particular Wednesday, alone with only a 
was working at a car dealership and I don't know, this is a few years back our business had just moved in, to a new place it was just down the road and the cars were parked in an open air parking garage one way in one way out with one set of stairs which was right by the entrance I'm chilling at the entrance and I hear a door fucking slam and I find this kind of strange since no cars had driven in and no one had gone up the stairs I started walking up the stairs I hear another door slam shut I'm thinking okay this is ridiculous what is happening the next day I tell my co-workers what happened and they all think I'm just being crazy, delusional, atypical newbie. Now let's go forward a week. I travel down the road to another dealership to pick up some parts, which is a common thing. The dealership I went to had just moved out from where my company had moved into. I walked down to the parts department and grabbed my part, but as I'm walking away, the guy behind the counter asks if I've worked at the night shift yet at our new location. I turn around and give him a weird look. I have why. He just shrugged his shoulders pointed at me and said, just be careful, that place is haunted. Immediately, goosebumps covered my body. But then he proceeded to ask me if I had any experiences based upon the terrified look on my face. I said yes, just a week ago. He said it was normal. You get used to it. Just don't pay attention to them. I quit the next day. It freaked me out. As an overnight worker, this is what I would fear the most. Disembodied anything. Singing, children talking, people talking, anything disembodied. That is not truly really there. So I worked overnights at two different 24-hour residential treatment centers for teens. I call it poltergeist soup. Staff and clients would see and hear things. We would hear things, see people during the middle of the night. Every single night. And not just the ones in recovery. The staff too. It was almost like whatever was affecting these patients was not of this world. It was weird. I remember when I worked at a drug and alcohol rehab facility, it used to be a nunnery attached to a church. I used to hear women singing through our speaker that communicated with the door. 
as I was working in Antarctica. I was at a, a station with an elephant seal mating ground. I thought I had left something in a shipping container by the docks next to the elephant seals. Mindful of my safety and being a bit lazy, I grabbed a ute or utility vehicle. Drove down there at midnight. I parked running with the lights on, mostly so I could see in the hellacious darkness. But as soon as I got out, I realized that it was seriously dark. No moon, no building lights. I couldn't see my hand in front of me, and I intentionally left my headlights on. What the heck? The car had turned off. scared you are after listening to a true crime podcast or watching a true crime show or listening to a true crime video on YouTube or somewhere. Yeah, well, a greenhouse 
house worker. Yes, I was spooked after hours of listening to this damn true crime podcast. I love listening to true crime. This summer I worked by myself in a greenhouse at my university that was on the top of the ninth floor of this building. To even get into the building you need card access. But to use the elevator you need card access and a key. Over the summer almost nobody was ever on campus, especially not on this floor or even in the building that I was in for that matter. After probably a six hour work day alone on the top floor of this building listening to creepy murder stories, I am pushing my cart to the elevator. A massive industrial industrial freight elevator that no one else uses. I scanned my card and waited for the elevator to reach my floor. I could hear it coming and coming and coming. For some reason, it was taking forever. I'm just standing there listening to this podcast about some serial killer. Once it finally, finally came to the ninth floor, I got ready to open the outer door and happened to peer into the little window and see something inside staring at me through. I screamed and jumped back before I realized it was another research student coming up to use the greenhouse. My advice to people working late night shifts
the game. 